Leaving the courtroom today, Donald Trump says he will testify in his first criminal trial, which appears to be moving full steam ahead. Twelve jurors and six alternates have officially been selected and sworn in. And opening statements are set to begin Monday morning. But we did not get here without some intense and, at times, emotional moments inside the courtroom. To quote my colleague, the great Lisa Rubin, if today's jury selection had a theme song, it would be under pressure. This morning, three prospective jurors, all of whom are women, expressed concerns about their inability to serve due to their fears surrounding the case. The first juror was dismissed after saying she has really bad anxiety and wouldn't be able to be completely here and fair, adding, people have found out where I am. Another broke down crying while she was being questioned, saying, I have to be honest. I feel so nervous and anxious right now. A third juror was excused after saying she felt anxiety and self-doubt her voice audibly cracking while answering questions. All of this underscores the unique challenge the jurors in this trial face, a trial that at times has felt more like that of a mob boss than that of a former president. Today, for example, Trump's attorneys once again asked for the name of the first witness, which the DA's office has refused to share with the defense due to the fact that Trump has been posting about everyone and anyone involved in the case on social media, including the judge and his family. The DA's office responded that they will give the name on Sunday and, quote, if that should be tweeted, that'll be the last time we provide that courtesy. And who could blame them? I mean, we are talking about someone who has multiple times compared himself favorably to America's most infamous mobster, Al Capone. I've been indicted more than Alphonse Capone, Mr. President. Do you know who that is? Even the president just said, I do. Scarface, Al Capone. If he had dinner with you and he didn't like the smile in your face, he thought you were mocking him by smiling, you would be dead before you got home and said hello to your wife. Joining me now is Lisa Rubin, MSNBC legal correspondent, and Harry Littman, former U.S. attorney. Uh, Lisa, I mean, he, he, Donald Trump saying if you if Al Capone didn't like you, you'd be dead before you made it home. That's how he talks. Talk about the, the spectacle of potential jurors, including women who are nervous and know that their names could get out, um, having to sit before him today and potentially be on this jury. Joy, I was most struck by the second of the three jurors that you were talking about because that prospective juror, during answering the jury questionnaire, revealed that she had two relationships that might be potentially of interest to the former president. First, her father is lifelong friends with another American politician who is infamously a nemesis of the former president. And she also added that she works at a company at which a famous witness who was also engaged in a grudge match with former President Trump, he has a son who works there, too. And although she didn't know him, she said it was possible that she could encounter him in the future. And then when Susan Necklace, who's one of former President Trump's lawyers, got up to question the jurors about whether they could be fair, whether they would accept principles like the fact that somebody changes their story multiple times might be evocative of the fact that they're not telling the truth. During some of that questioning, that's when the juror cracked, not before, not with anything else going on, she literally burst into tears and said, I feel so nervous and anxious right now. I don't know that I can do this. And you could feel the empathy of all of the people in the overflow room where I was sitting with about 100 journalists, just everyone really feeling for this woman, because we understand that this isn't a person who just talks like Al Capone and compares himself favorably to Al Capone, but is facing a contempt hearing on Tuesday for what? for 10 public statements, most of them social media posts, where he has talked about witnesses in the case and at one point quoted a Fox News host who was talking about liberal activists trying to insert themselves secretly onto this jury. That's enough to make anybody nervous. And there's also the issue of sexual assault, which came up in the case. Talk a little bit about that, because this involves what Stormy Daniels will ultimately testify to and whether jurors had uh, essentially would not be able to be objective based on that issue. 
There is a prospective juror who talked about having been a victim of sexual assault not once, but twice, and she was asked again by Susan Eccles, one of Trump's lawyers, whether that would be a problem for her given some of the accusations against former President Trump. At that point, she said, these are accusations that are entirely outside the case. And you could hear some of the journalists in the room gasp because, as you just noted, Stormy Daniels has recently characterized the relationship that she had with former President Trump as something other than perfectly consensual. And so you can tell now that that's going to be a disputed issue in the case. Whether or not they had a relationship is one contested fact, right? Because President Trump is going to maintain he never was engaged in any sexual affairs of any kind with Stormy Daniels or Karen McDougal, the Playboy model, who received a settlement from the National Enquirer on his behalf. But more than that, if, even if the jurors are inclined to believe there was something going on, Stormy Daniels has indicated that she intends to tell her truth, which is that that relationship between them wasn't one she entered willingly. And I have the feeling that that is going to be a big theme here, as it has been in the Eugene Carroll case. And the district attorney announced today that if they get to cross-examine former President Trump, they believe the verdicts in both of the Eugene Carroll cases are fair mm -hmm. game, including the finding that Trump sexually assaulted Eugene Carroll. And, Harry, let's get in on what the prosecutors are thinking now. They're going to have to give the name uh, of whoever that person is. And this is what Ruth Ben-Ghiat, who specializes in autocracy, she said, as a scholar of strongman, I agree with Mary Trump, that's Trump's niece's assessment, of the psychological cost of the trial for Trump. Some individuals cannot bear the feeling of being constrained by others. The usual forms of asserting dominance are not available to him in the courtroom, but they are available outside the courtroom. As soon as that name is released, we know what he's going to do. So a few things. First, their non-release of it, Joy, this is, it's not a small point. You can guarantee that the two Trump lawyers are going to have a hellish weekend. It's one thing to prepare solidly to, to cross-examine someone you know who it will be, that it could be anyone at all. That's a serious sort of sanction for his um, misbehavior. But second, yes, it, you know, it, it, it is exactly uh, as you say. The, there has been, on the one hand, a co he, Judge Merchant made quick work of things, Justice Merchant, but yet there are these eruptions of kind of chaos and stress, and we have almost a tale of two trials. And as it goes forward, those will be the sort of high points that people remember. And this, this trial could be really freighted going forward, or it could stay smooth. It's been uh, two different kinds of weeks, it seems to me. And if you were prosecuting this case, who would you call first? Because there are different ways to do it. I mean, Michael Cohen uh, was at the yeah. start of the catch and kill trial, as was David Pecker from the National Enquirer. Or they could go back and start with Stormy Daniels. What, what would you anticipate uh, being that first witness? Yeah, it's a, it's a great and big question. Cohen, they've said, is going to be the sort of tour guide, but I think it'd be a mistake and they won't start with him. My best guess is Pecker. They will first start the story, the whole kind of catch and kill through McDougal, and then set things up for either that or a very sort of banal witness that just goes through paperwork. But I think they'll start with low emotional intensity, but then try to frame the story and have Cohen somewhere in the middle. You don't want him as the last. You don't want him as the first. And give us a sense of what we're, uh, we should expect to see, Lisa, uh, on Monday morning at 9.30 sharp a.m. Well, at 9.30 sharp, Joy, we're going to have a little bit of judicial housekeeping. Just Mershon is going to tell us what the permissible scope is going to be of that cross-examination about Trump's prior misconduct and unlawful acts. But after that, we're going to get straight to opening statements from the DA's office and then, in turn, from Trump's lawyers. And I don't expect that that will take more than an hour in change on either side. And then, as Harry said and previewed, we'll get to the first witness. And my prediction is that first witness is going to be David Pecker. And that's because the very first event in this indictment, if you're going chronologically, is a 2015 meeting at Trump Tower between Cohen, Pecker, and a person that our own Tom Winter reported in 2018 was none other than Donald Trump. Putting Trump in the room at the beginning of the scheme is critical, and not having Michael Cohen do it is even more critical.
Uh, Lisa Rubin, Harry Littman, thank you, and I expect to see you don't make a lot of plans for the next six weeks. <laughs> hey, everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.